his magnificent beard. The only person that would rival this beard is Mr. Dishon's, but this man's is even better. And Mr. Dishon would. Ooh. Oh, see that these beards are just great. This is something you could nest in if you're a bird. Oh, oh I wonder how my family pro. We did not do well then. If I can't grow a beard, or maybe it just passed by. So before Darwin in the early 1800s, what did ideas existed? So we're gonna talk about evolution. Christians started the creation believed by scientists as well as Christian story. Yeah, yeah. The Christian story of creation, there we go, the seas was killing me there, uh, was believed by scientists as well as ordinary people. So early on, the, the primary beliefs were the creation story that was created and earth, life evolved from there and in Europe. And many other cultures had their own creation story as well. So depending on where you were would depend on what creation story you followed at the time. However, as we've more developed our scientific equipment, we've more excavated, we've more done all of that. In the 1700s, when fossils started being discovered, scientists began thinking, well, life's changing over time. We noticed this in these fossils, and as we've seen things change, we see these fossils, and things have changed within those bone structures from the fossils. So what scientists were starting to be like, hmm, this was there, but it's not here. As they dug deeper, they noticed different changes in the fossil. So they're like, hmm, these things changed over time. Why is that? What was happening? So that's when the idea of evolution, things changing over time, began. And this was the very primitive way of thinking about it, was the, just the bone structure, because, again, that's all they had to go on at the time. If you think about what access they had to, like, equipment and everything, it was very primitive compared to what we have today in regards to, like, carbon dating and everything, so. What do people think of us that way? Like, oh, people will think of, well, oh, yeah. If you think evolutionarily speaking, when, when people look back, they're going to look, well, only bonus today is it's more documented and we have more, better equipment. But then as we get old, as we, whatever, there will be other changes. It's fascinating. I love it. I just thinking about the future of what people are going to look back at, even in Miss Murdoch and I's own time. Like thinking back to it, we had phones. And just thinking about life in general evolves. Oh, I just, I'm so fascinated by life. Oh. Okay, sorry. I'll get back onto it. So, what does the theory of evolution say? Everybody take a pick of a choice, please. Let me see how many people responded. Four out of the 26 are participating. Oh, nine of you. I know Gary T is one of them. Thank you, Gary T. So what the biffle does. All right, let me show our responses. All right, let's see here. Uh, mm, living things go extinct. Mm, you had to, no, no, no. Living, yeah, living things stay the same. Nope, that's good. Living things are very diverse. Living things are, that's not, it is living things changed over time. Very, excellent, excellent, excellent. So scientists had theorized about evolution, but how could life change? So again, guys, you're, a lot of this you're going to be like, that is absurd. But you have to think about the time and what axis. First, we got this guy in the 1800s called Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And he said organisms change by, in, by inheriting acquired characteristics. And you're going to be like, Mr. Bouchard, what is acquired characteristics? Well, I'm going to give you a great example in just a minute. And some way you could think of this as if you get in a car accident, you lose an arm, you're not going to have a child who has one arm missing. All right? That's what he means by acquired characteristics. And we're going to give you some prime examples in just a second. I know it's a little gruesome of one, but Ms. Murdoch told me to use that one. She was very gruesome with it. I'm throwing her under the bus. All right. So... So here's the more the, the the way that you'll probably see it on the SOL as well. You'll probably see this picture or something. They've usually used this one a lot. And Lamarck's idea of evolution, an individual can evolve in its lifetime. So Lamarck's like it can change within its own life and pass its traits down to its offsprings, acquired characteristics. So for example, he the the short necked giraffe keeps stretching and as it reaching higher for food on a higher one, it's saying it's stretching its own neck and they will have offspring who have a long neck. 
And that is not. This is one. One Remarkable theorizing if that one individual keeps stretching its neck and stretching its neck, its neck will get longer during its lifetime, and then it passes that trait to its offspring. Which Can is I not supported. <laughs> not supported by any evidence. It doesn't work that way. I want to be correct. You're born with whatever length, length of neck you're always going to have. <laughs> um, so, so individuals can't evolve. That's what Lamarck said, that is that individuals were evolving during their lifetime. Darwin that was going to come next said something different. Oh, and she beat me too. Lamarck's idea was incorrect. Individuals can grow or build muscles during lifetime, but that is not inherited by their children. If you cut the wings off a fly, its offspring are not born without wings. Really gruesome with her examples. Losing arms, losing wings. And, yeah, so the giraffe, and we'll keep going. Next idea was Charles Darwin. So 1798, Thomas Malthus, humans will grow faster than their food supply. So is he the one who talked about out uh, the the Malthus? Yeah. in London and saying, we're going to run out of food and people are going to start starving. Well, you think you write the wall of nations? Yes. Uh oh, that's the name. Yeah, this is the guy. And he's not mm. a biologist at all, right? He's not a scientist at all. But his ideas um, were ideas that Charles Darwin read when he was a young man. And he thought, hmm, I wonder if that applies to natural populations. Good for you. Wait, well, I mean, there certainly have been human populations that have been struggling in some places because there's so many people and not enough food, right? Like in places in Africa, there have been famines. Right, well, not right here. Not over here in the West. We have, yeah, we have, over, here, over here, we have more people. We do, but it's not well distributed. There are people starving in America. Right. Well, so, yep. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. And then, so in the early 1830s, like Ms. Murdoch said, Charles Darwin used this and applied it to natural populations of animals. Next one, sorry. Ugh, why am I so sweaty today? So, in, born in 1809, England, rich, intended for the church or as a physician. So, during the 1800s, you were either, if you were rich, you were going to go either to a church, because that's where all the most educated people during that time would go. And wealthy people tended to be the most educated because, A, they had access to it. And so they were part of the church or they became like physicians or doctors or, or stuff within the higher echelons of society. But, however, he was born an explorer. He was a very curious-minded guy. He, he was an, Would you call him a naturalist, Ms. Murdoch? Mm -hmm. Darrell Darwin? Oh, definitely. He was so curious about nature and so like focused on all the different changes the variations of things and so in 1831 he took a voyage of the beagle i always think of it as like a snoopy um, the beagle hms beagle <laughs> i would think of it as. in my head i just think of a snoopy ship <laughs> so during this time during this voyage, look at all the different places they would stop and go through, like Galapagos, Lima. Um, so during this whole time, he would get out, he would gather all this, he would look at all the insects, all the plants. Cape Town, yes, you're right, Banky, Cape Town. Yeah, they stop everywhere. So they would look at everything. And he would gather all the data. He would take all these insects. He's like, oh, look at the insects here. Look at the plants here. Look at the birds. Look at all the stuff here. And then when he stopped at his next place, he's like, oh, my gosh, it's a little different. Look at this. Look at all this here. And he would take it all in. And he would observe it all. And notice, he didn't just go one place. They went all over. So Darwin's trip resulted in his idea of natural selection. So natural selection had these main points, variation, already present in the population, 
So um, he had a bunch of beetles. He looked at beetles. And you might see an example of Darwin with beetles, and he has a beetle named after him. I just learned today. Ms. Murdoch and I were talking this morning. They had it called the Darwin beetle. Is that right? Darwin's frog. Darwin's frog. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking beetles. She said frog. Most people, when they're asked about, hey, do you remember what Darwin said in the natural selection? Most people say, oh, that's the guy that said survival of the fittest, right? You guys remember that term, survival of the fittest? Most people only remember that one. Look where it is in the list. Four. It's down a bit. Yeah. Okay. So people, a lot of people don't realize there's a little bit more around it. You guys need to know what the other steps are. So variation. Oops, sorry. Oh, okay. So variation already present in the population, meaning different types within that population. There's um And they're overproduction of offspring. What does he mean by overproduction of offspring? Oh, okay. And the way you can think about that to help you understand a little more is during, so if there is no lower hanging vegetables anymore for the short neck giraffes to eat, they're going to die and they won't be able to pass on their traits. So that trait dries off while the long neck giraffes who are able to reach the higher food source can eat it, still survive. They'll procreate passing on that long neck. And that's sort of how it happens. It doesn't happen like this either. You guys got to realize this takes time. It is slow change. It doesn't just happen like, it wasn't like one generation and all of a sudden you got all long neck giraffes and you got no little short. It just takes time. So just understand that. It doesn't just, it's not like a magic show and poof, something changes. It takes time. I got, I can't stress that enough. Some people are like, oh, just really quick. No. So which of these natural selections? I love this one. I love the picture. It made me smile. Which of these does the step shows picture represent? Look at those little kitty cats. Look at all those kitty cats. Has seven of you. I know Gary T responded. Did you respond, Sarah? Uh, nice Will change still take place even if environment didn't change? Uh, well, it. Ms. Murdoch, well, it could. Well, there's always competition between species too, as well. So that's something that leads to that struggle for existence. So, because Benke asked, will change happen if the environment didn't change? Change still happens, it just, it's just different stressors. Yeah, I don't think so. And if you think, And if you think about it in regards to the virus too, like unfortunately those, some people that passed away from this virus, they, 
younger and it's sad and maybe they didn't pass along their traits or able to reproduce while those that were able to survive from it passed along and they're now more capable of handling this virus so huh oh sorry i was answering banky's question online will change take place even environmental change environment will always change i think i feel like oh this one i haven't gone to you sorry i was responding to him online he asked me a question so variation exists in the population yes Change within that population. Excellent. Be careful not to pick, what was that? Population changes over time. That's not over time, guys. That was within that population of cats. They were all just variations among that population. Now at the bottom, if they had eras and they had changed, that'd be different. But that was all the same. Which part of natural selection does this step picture? Eh. Which Oh, yeah. If you've never seen this, it's so cute. I saw it once, Ms. Murdoch. It was amazing. It was a once-in-a-lifetime thing I'll ever I remember I was walking the beach at night, and this guy, there was like a conservation people down in the Outer Banks, and they go, do not come near here. Do not, just watch. And I was like, what? And they put it on, the, and they just started emerging, and they started going out to the water. And I was like, Like a guard off thing where the yeah, where the turtles were. The beach one day, so. Did you get to see them? I would go with over over produ over production of offspring. So guys, you overproduce a lot of that is actually one of the ways that some species survive is by overproducing. For example, gerbils they overproduce. And it's sad to say, the ones that get eaten satiate the predators, and the ones that survive, that's why they sometimes overproduce. They're just re there's biological reasons for this overproduction so that the species can live. So the more you have produced, the more likely one of them is to survive. Basically, you're getting your, your odds of survival are increased when you overproduce offspring. I, I wouldn't put struggle for existence at this point because this is just dealing with the amount there. Overproduction. Yeah. That's a good question. And they are cute. I thought so. I like it is a good question. Which part of natural selection does this step represent, or does this picture represent? Oof. My wording today. This heat. Oof. I am a sweaty, sweaty man. Huh? I don't get sweaty hands. Not sweaty hands, I get sweaty armpits. It was too much information, wasn't it? And sweaty backs. I just thought it was awkward growing up when I went to a doctor about it, and they were like, oh, you just silver and sweat. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Or, or you can put population slowly changes. But I survive. Let me show the picture. Where's my hide response? Sorry. Survival of the fittest, because these two will not survive. This one, what the X means is they die out. So this one. Gary T. This is my best friend. Me and Gary T are best friends. Yeah. 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 See, Mr. Mr. Roland's surprised I have a best friend too. Gary is supposed to be my best friend, and then he ignored me in the hallway. I mean, he's a little shocked. Shocked? <laughs> wow, I don't know how I feel about this. Man, I've been getting it from both ends of people today. Miss <laughs> Murdoch calling me enveloped, him being shocked that I have a best friend. I need therapy after this. Um, but <laughs> these two X's mean that they will die off, and this one's best suited for the environment. So best survival of the fittest best adapted to live i wouldn't put, do population slowly changes because it's not showing a population yeah yeah oh i like this one <laughs> which part of natural selection does this picture represent He's like, yo, 
Frank, the green ones, they're cream filled. You got to get the green ones. They're all cream filled. They're delicious. You squeeze them and then you eat the thorax to get the cream out of your beak. They do definitely have that voice. I would go. Yeah, because it shows what I want to show you is look, Gen Miss Rock wrote word generations later. So this shows earlier and this is later. So by that, you're talking about change of a population. I'd understand the struggle for existence and best suit, but the best one is population change slowly changes because it's talking about it had one generation, it's a generations later, this one. So good job. Oh, so then 1859, Darwin po published on the origin of species. And this is probably the most famous picture you'll ever, uh, I, this picture everybody associates with Darwin. And I love it. I think it's just, it's, I, I don't know what I like about it. It's just endearing. Anybody online or in person? You want had all the right. What do you mean had all the right? Make sure you had all the right stuff. You want to gather all of them. Yeah, that's that's part of it. But why do you think he waited? So yeah, he waited until he was like probably twenty seven or something. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think that it was not. He knew it wasn't going to be a popular idea. He knew a lot of people were going to be very upset with him um, because it went against something. It went against something that people believed as a matter of um, so it was and it was not well received. He was derided. He was criticized. At least it wasn't like in the times of um, you know when we used to burn people to say saying things like this, but it wasn't oh. like that. But he was he Sorry. was shunned from a lot of society. He didn't want anything to do with him. And yeah, as, a, as an old man, he felt figured that he could handle that. He didn't want his family to go through that when he was young. And he actually had a friend who was going to publish something similar, message him, "Don't go that." Okay. Yeah, that's true. You're right. Oh man, I can't give all the backstories anymore. The beagle was on. Was the ship took Doran on a voyage to the. Does anybody remember? It's a very famous. They're now blocked off. You can't go on them without special passes. It's like a, a very, very special place you can't go to unless you're studying life on there. Let's see what we have. Galapagos Islands. Yes. The Galapagos Islands is where he went. And you can't really go there now because it's, it's blocked off as like a place for scientists to study and it's just uh, really unencumbered, like it's not been impacted by like buildings and everything. It's a very natural setting, and a lot of people study life. You can go there, but you're going there, you study life and all of that. They don't just let people go there to vacation. Which of the following people said that individuals can evolve during their lifetime, meaning a giraffe could get a longer neck by stretching it through each high leaves? Which guy said that? Yeah, who was that? Which guy? Which guy? We got. Oh, we're we're on a sliding scale here. I would not go Mendel. We're not even I mentioned his name yet today. Lamarck, not Watson. That's the DNA guy. Changing over life. Lamarck, excellent. Thank you guys. Good, good, good. Now, which scientists said that individuals do not evolve, but populations can evolve? Example, a tortoise population changes over the generations as those born with longer necks live to reproduce. You're in Hungary, right? 
Not Franklin. Let's not select. Come on, guys. We didn't say any of those down there. It's got to be Darwin or Lamarck. Those are two we talked about. And it is Darwin. Yes. Populations change over time, not individuals. I got to stress that enough to you guys. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a three-minute break, a four-minute break. I want you to get up. I got a song I'm going to play real quick. Um, we're going to take a break. Where is... Uh... Yeah, we'll, we'll put this up there for you, Gary. I mean, not Gary, Pedro. <laughs> 